Hi everyone. In this video, I just want to explain the limitations of using the consumer price index as a measure of the cost of living and treating the inflation rate based upon the consumer price index as a measure of what's happening to the cost of living over time. Now, if you think about it, the very strength of the consumer price index is actually going to be one of its biggest weaknesses. So the problem is this. The consumer price index tracks the cost of a fixed basket of goods over time. And if that cost is rising, we say the cost of living has gone up. So far, that makes perfect sense. So the key thing here is the CPI tracks the relative cost of a fixed basket. Okay. Now that makes sense. The government goes out periodically, I believe it's every other year now, they survey and see what the common consumers, the typical American household is purchasing, and then they go ahead and um, uh, use that as the fixed basket for the next couple of years, and then they go out and do another survey in a few years, and they update that fixed basket of goods. Okay, but think about what that means. There's going to be four sources of bias that we think lead to the consumer price index overstating increases in the cost of living. And the first one of these is substitution bias. Now really, for the consumer price index to be an accurate measure of the cost of living, it's, gonna ha it's going to have to tell you how expensive it is for households to achieve some overall level of happiness. Well, as it turns out, households don't buy the same fixed basket of goods over time. Households respond to changes in the economy, and in particular, they change and respond to, uh, in response to changes in the prices of these goods and services. So imagine, I don't know, pick a hypothetical example, households spend 1% of their budget on oranges every year because they really like orange juice, it tastes good, they like to eat fresh oranges, that type of thing. But then imagine that there's a severe drought or bad weather in Florida, so half the U.S. orange crop gets wiped out, the price of oranges rises. Well, households just don't passively accept the rise in orange prices and then buy exactly the same amount of oranges they were buying before but at a higher price, what they do is they substitute away from oranges towards other fruits. They might buy more apples, more pears, or things of that nature. So the first bias in the consumer price index is it doesn't change, it doesn't take into account changes in the composition of the fixed basket. So um, does, how do I want to put this? I'll just say, doesn't account for, doesn't account for the response of consumers to changing relative prices. Now this used to be a much bigger deal than it is now because the government would just keep the fixed basket of good constant for either five or ten years, but now they're updating it every two years or so, so it's much less of an issue, but it still exists. Second source of bias is what we call new goods bias. All right, so the government goes out, it does these surveys, finds out what the typical household is purchasing and then it goes out and um, tracks the cost of that fixed basket over, con over time. Okay, so far so good. The problem is when the government does a survey say in 2005 to see what the typical household is buying, that doesn't contain things like iPhones, which didn't exist until 2007. But in the year 2007, a lot of people are buying iPhones. Likewise, a couple of years later, people are buying iPads, but those might not be in the fixed basket of goods that the government is tracking. So the point is, new goods appear, goods appear, which don't, oop, appear if I could spell, which don't immediately show up in the fixed basket, which don't immediately show up in the fixed basket.
And these new goods can often do lots of things that old goods can do, but they can do them better, or maybe they do things which old goods couldn't do. So the iPhone had a, a much better camera, so that was an improvement over old ones. Um, but the very first cell phones, when they appeared, they were doing something that no other good or service could do, which allowed you to talk to somebody on a cellular phone. Uh, same thing with iPads. They did something that wasn't easily reproducible by other electronic gadgets, such as computers. So for that reason, we think that um, these new goods come along and they um, satisfy needs and wants of consumers in ways that it's very difficult for the consumer price index to go ahead and take into account. So these are the first two biases, the substitution bias and the new goods bias. The third one, which I'll put here, is quality bias. So even if new goods are not appearing all the time, the quality of goods and services will change over time. So for example, if you spent $2,000 on a computer, or I spent $2,000 on a computer in 1996, um, and I got a computer with, a, by today's standards, a very small hard drive, a very slow processor, the monitor wasn't that great, etc. But at the time, it was a pretty good computer. If I were to spend $2,000 today on a desktop computer, it would be far superior in all respects to the computer I bought in 1996. Yet, for purposes of the fixed basket of goods, if um, the fixed basket of goods says people spend, you know, half a percent of their income each year on computers, uh, then I'm getting a heck of a lot more bang for my buck, or I'm getting a heck of a lot more, or the $2,000 I'm going to spend on a computer this year, um, I'm going to get a far superior computer that can do many things that my old computer just couldn't possibly do. Just to give you an example, if I buy a new computer this year for $2,000, it's going to have wireless. Back in 1996, when I bought a new computer, I don't think I even had the option to have wireless internet in there, and it was a landline. I mean, it was a um, modem. So the big feature was that uh, it had a built-in modem, so it was easy for me to go ahead and connect the internet over dial-up. So even though I spent $2,000 back then and I'm spending $2,000 today, I'm getting a lot more for those $2,000. Same thing happens with stuff like cars. So you go back 20 years, it's very rare for cars to have um, airbags, to have anti-lock brakes, and other certain safety features that are now just quite standard. So even with things like cars, you're getting a lot more for the amount of money you're spending um, compared to did, did, did in the past. And that ex those extra features you're getting are worth something to people. So even though I'm spending $2,000 on a computer in 1995 and $2,000 on a computer in, in 2013, I'm getting a lot more for that $2,000 than I was in the past. And this typical... Um, calculation for the consumer price index doesn't really take that into account. And the fourth bias is I'll just go ahead and, well, I guess I can do it right here. Um, it's called the outlet bias, or new outlet bias. Much bigger in the 1990s, but it's actually kind of big today with the internet. So when the Bureau of Labor Statistics goes out and it surveys prices to see, well, just how much do eggs cost and how much does clothing cost and groceries and things of that nature, they tend to go to establishments that have been around for a long period of time. Well, that meant during the 1990s, as Walmart was getting more and more into um, groceries and you started seeing grocery markets appear in Walmart, the government was missing that. So if the price of produce and food was rising at your standard uh, supermarkets like Safeway and Big Y and Stop and Shop, etc. Um, people were substituting away from purchasing goods and services at those outlets to buying them at Walmart. And if prices were lower at Walmart, then the consumer price index was not rising nearly as much or prices of goods and services were not rising nearly as much as what the government thought they were. And as a result, the consumer price index is going to overstate the cost of living, and an inflation rate calculated using the consumer price index as the measure of the price level will overstate the growth in the cost of living. Now, the government's taken steps over the years to reduce these biases, but uh, depending on which economist you talk to, it still looks like the, bi the, 
these biases lead to an overestimate of the cost of living on the order of about half a percent a year or maybe even one percent a year. So if the consumer price index goes up by 2.1 percent in the year 2012, you know, the actual cost of living for people in the United States probably went up by something less than that. It may have gone up by as little as 1.1 percent or as much as 1.6 percent. The magnitudes of these biases are a little bit iffy, so it's a little bit hard to tell, but we do know that the consumer price index overstates the cost of living for these four reasons. It's a little bit uncertain of how much it overstates it.